Well, hello, everybody. The price we pay for the inequities in our cities measures in the billions in our cities, in the trillions nationwide. And the good news is, is that there's something that we can do about it. Growth alone, however, cannot solve these inequalities and these inequities. But solving these inequalities and these inequities gets us growth. So let's go to the point that inequities are costing us. A story done, uh, a study done, cited by PolicyLink, says that nationally it is costing us $1.2 trillion a year to be investing in the inequalities in our communities. $1.2 trillion that we're sacrificing every year in the maintenance of the inequalities that we have in our communities and in our country. And this is a downward spiral for our cities. We don't have the workforce that we need. We don't have the consumer base that we need. We have an atmosphere where people become a little hesitant to invest because they don't know if they're going to have the consumer base or the workforce base that they're going to need. It's a downward spiral when what we're aiming for, especially right now, is an upward spiral. And growth alone doesn't always solve this problem. Growth in and of itself doesn't get it doesn't always get us what we need. So let's take a look at Minneapolis as an example. So the racial disparities that we have in Minneapolis and in St. Paul are the largest in the country on almost any measure that you care to name. Employment, housing, health, education, incarceration, the list goes on. This is for our region. The numbers for Minneapolis are even more stark. We have some of the biggest disparities in the country. This is not what we want for our city. Education, for example, when you take a look at the graduation rates for our kids, we have a 25% graduation rate for American Indian kids in the Minneapolis school system, 37% for African American and Latino kids. When you combine this with where we know our demographics are going, right now Minneapolis is 40% people of color, 60% whites. We know that by 2040 we're going to be a majority minority city. When you look at where we're going, our population, and then who is enrolled in our public schools, and then you combine that with the numbers we have about our disparities, we know that this is not sustainable. We know this is not workable if we want to develop and grow in our city. And I know this pattern is happening in cities all across the country. This is playing out everywhere. I hear it when we talk at the National League. I hear it when we talk at the US Conference of Mayors. It's playing out. But the good news is, in Minneapolis, is that we are entering the recovery sooner than almost any other city in the country. That we are having a building boom, that we are having uh, people come in and say, we want to build something, and we say, great, go build it. Those numbers are good. That's what you want in your city. It's going crazy. <laughs> it's going crazy in Minneapolis right now. <laughs> but, It really is. Uh, but that growth is not solving the equity problem. That growth is not for everybody. Because if you look at those unemployment rates, while, uh, while it, the rates are getting uh, better, kind of, the gap is remaining the same. The gap is remaining the same. The moral of that story is the rising tide lifting all boats isn't doing what we need it to do. The rising tide is not lifting all boats. If you don't have a boat, if you have a car and the tide is rising or your boat is leaky, the rising tide is not going to help you very much. So we have to get beyond the rising tide lifting all boats as our growth strategy and our inequality strategy. Those two things coupled together are not going to get us where we want to go. It's not enough to know that growth is important. We also have to know that inclusive growth is a better endpoint than growth alone. In other words, we have to know that if we invest in making sure everybody has access to opportunity, but that everybody has good access and what they need to actually succeed, if we know that that is our endpoint, we have a whole bunch of tools at our disposal that can make that go better. Because we need something instead of the rising tide. We need two things. We need universal shared goals about what we want for ourselves as a people and as a community. 
And we also need policies that are tailored to make sure that people can actually meet the goal. It is not enough to have a goal. We want to set it up so people can actually meet it. So what does it mean to have a universally shared goal? We have a lot of those in this country. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, uh, education. Sometimes we even aspire to have a high quality education for kids. Uh, sometimes we aspire to have a high quality education for all kids. These are the kind of shared goals that as a community we don't even necessarily always have to talk about to know that we share. Universal programs are universally supported. Sometimes the people who say, get your hands off my social security are the same people saying, let's get rid of welfare. Because when people know that there's something in it for them, they like it. So we get to come up, one of the work, you know, one of the bits of work that we get to do as mayors, as public officials, as people out in the world, one of the pieces of work we get to do is help make sure everybody in our community is sharing the goal because they have a say in it, they have a say in deciding what that goal is, but they also know that if you meet it, there's something in it for them. Everybody has to be invested in everybody meeting the goal. That, that's why it has to be a universal shared goal. And one of those goals we have is growth. And like I said, it is not enough, however, for growth to be the goal. We have to know that inclusive growth is a better endpoint, it's a better place to get to than growth alone. You know, internationally, let's take a look internationally. What they have found, what the IMF has found, is that for every 10% decrease in inequality, meaning you reduce your inequity in your country, in your area by 10%, that in those places, it increased the length of their growth spell by 50%. So if you just let growth go, great. But if you actually reduce your inequalities, you will be going longer and faster with your growth than if you had done nothing about your inequities and your inequalities at all. That's a big thing. In a country that's leaving $1.2 trillion on the table, in a world where we want to enter this economic recovery and stay in it as long as possible, dealing with our inequalities is the way to that growth is the way to that level of success. That's the work that we get to do together. So let's take a look more locally. In Minneapolis and St. Paul, if we eliminated our disparities by 2040, what would it look like? What could it look like by 2040? 274,000 fewer people in poverty, 171,000 more high school diplomas, 124,000 more people with jobs, and get this, $31.8 billion more in personal income from reducing and eliminating those in inequities and inequalities that we have between white people and people of color in our area. That is a huge thing. That would mean a lot to us and to our region. Uh, to have that, and I'm sure that is true all across the country, it's true all around the world. So it's our work, it's our work to make this case, to say to people, look, if you have two similarly situated cities, you have one here and one here, both of them are going to grow. Let's say they're both entering the recovery, they're both going to grow. If one of them does concentrated work on reducing the inequalities, that one's going to grow better, it's going to go faster, and it's going to grow for over a longer period of time. That's inclusive growth. That's the case that we get to make. That's one of the universal goals that we can come together and that we can share so that we can actually do some things to make it work, because that's the second thing that we need. We need tailor po tailored policies. We need to make sure that people who are you know, situated slightly differently toward that goal have the opportunity to actually meet the goal, and they have what they need to meet the goal. So let me give you a simple example. Let's say we have a goal, and we want everybody to be able to look over a six-foot fence, I don't know, to see a ball game or something like that. Well, listen, we are not all Bill de Blasio. I'm the, I'm the short one in front. He's the tall one in back. We are not all six foot seven, you know? Folks who are over six feet tall, they're gonna be able to see over that fence without a problem. Me, I'm gonna need a box of some kind to be able to look over that fence or a little ladder. Um, I do not have a you know, foot and a half vertical, so I can't jump to look. 
Uh, some people, um, you know, some people may need uh, something that sort of elevates them up. Some people who can't see very well may need someone with them to help describe what it is that's happening. You need a different set of tools if you are differently situated vis-a-vis uh, -vis the problem. But again, if we have a universally shared goal, if we are all invested in making sure that people, everybody reaches that goal because we know there's something in it for us, then we want tailored policies to make sure everybody can get there. We'll have buy-in to make sure that people get what they need. So that when you're looking over the fence, I mean, this is the difference between, inequal between equality and equity, right? I mean, equality is saying you're allowed to look over the fence, and we're not going to put a bunch of barbed wire there preventing you from doing it. That's, in some ways, what people think of when they think equal in equality. But if we actually are invested in making sure people actually get to look over the fence, we're going to have to do some different things, as the picture shows you. So this is inclusive growth. Equality says everybody can participate in our success. And inclusive growth says we need to make sure everybody actually participates in our success, in our success and in our growth. Uh, we need to make sure everybody can participate and that they can succeed. And we're going to set our government up. We're going to set our world up to have that happen because we know it's good for all of us. Those two things have to go together. White people, high-income people, people of color, lower-income people, everybody has to know there's something in it for them for this to work. But there is something in it for them for this to work. The great news is, is that we as cities have tools. We have tools to help make this happen. We have tools to help make this real. One of the things we do, and, and this is something we actually spent a fair amount of time on, is removing obstacles to participation in the workforce, removing obstacles for participation and shared success. So what would that look like? It would be uh, child care, making sure that people have child care so that they can participate in the workforce. It means training so that the jobs that are available, people aren't prevented from taking just because they don't have the right degree or the right training. Uh, it means transit making sure people can get to where the jobs are and that they can get to work. These are all great. If we did nothing but remove these obstacles, that is good work to do. But those don't all create jobs. Those are not job growth strategies. Those aren't growth strategies. Those are participation strategies, which we need, because we're going to be growing so fast, we're going to need everybody involved. But we also have tools that spur growth. We have tools at our disposal that spur growth. For example, education. In general, making sure education is going well is a really great thing to do. In specific, we have programs and policies that we can participate in. I, for one, have a Cradle to K initiative that I'm putting together that is about making sure that kids from age zero to age three get a very healthy start in the brain development they need so that they don't start early education already one down, not having heard enough words, not having the brain development they need. So if you couple that, with the childcare, which is you know, allowing parents to participate in the workforce, and if that childcare becomes child development-centered childcare, then you get a win. The parents can participate in the workforce, and the kids are getting the kind of childcare they need that gets the development they need so that they can actually take advantage of the early education, which we should all be supporting anyway. So that's one example of something you know, that it will actually spur growth, is making sure that we have the workforce that we need in the future. Transit. Oh, one more thing about early education. The return on investment, according to the Federal Reserve, Art Rolnick is, is from my hometown, 15 to 17% return on investment annually for investments in early childhood education. That's why I say we get to all be supporting early childhood. It's a great return on investment for us and our growth. Transit, in general, you get 31% more jobs when you invest in transit over roads and bridges. In specific, with rail, Investors are more confident investing around rails than they are on bus tires on the ground. Uh, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, this, this summer, we're going to open our, uh, our light rail line between Minneapolis and St. Paul. It hasn't opened yet, and it's generated over $2 billion worth of investment, private investment, around that line. Transit can serve not only to get people to jobs, but to bring jobs to people. And that light rail line? It goes through some of the poorest neighborhoods in St. Paul, and it comes to our university and goes downtown. That development is going where that development is needed most. A tailored policy, a tailored strategy to get to our overall goal, 
of people being able to get around town and participate in our growth. Entrepreneurship in general, we want people investing. Uh, more specifically, sometimes people have barriers to uh, investing. Um, in Minneapolis, we have a regulatory environment that is very um, complicated. It's a Byzantine system, to say the least. What I say is, you know, most cities you go to, they tell you you have to, you know, to invest in this city, to build a business in this city, you're going to have to go 8 or 10 miles. In Minneapolis, we tell you you have to go 15. And people say, okay, well, you're the big city. We want, we're willing to go 15 instead of 10. And then at mile 12, we tell them they have to go to mile 20. So one of the things I've done is go to my city attorney, and I've said, we need to do a complete review from stem to stern of all the, all the regulations governing small business in the city of Minneapolis to make sure that, um, to make sure that uh, we don't have, that we're eliminating the obstacles, that we're eliminating the obstacles and we're getting rid of the ro roadblocks. And then once we've done that, and we, that's good for everybody. Anybody who wants to develop in the city of Minneapolis, this will be good for. Anybody who wants to invest, that'll be good for. It'll reduce obstacles for everybody. But then we get to take it one step further. I, was, I met with a group of um, Somali women business owners in the city of Minneapolis. Minneapolis has the largest Somali population outside of Mogadishu in the entire world. And there are a lot of small investors. And there are a lot of women who are essentially running market stalls in what we call the malls. There are a couple of them, uh, and they're very, very small. They're basically, um, they're like stalls at a bazaar, at an international bazaar. Very, they're not just small business, they're micro business. And in talking to them, I realized a few things. We have good small business promotion um, policies and programs in the city of Minneapolis. 2% loan program, certain kinds of supports that you can get if you're a small business. But these women, one, the 2% loan program is hard for them. They come from a religion that does not, um, they, don't wanna, they don't wanna pay interest. They don't wanna deal with interest. And we do have tools developed by our African Development um, Corporation that has come up with some really creative ways that, they, that people can get loans, but they're for more traditional small businesses, not for these micro enterprises. And so we have to figure out how to connect those, the, you know, we have to figure out how to create the right policies and strategies for people so that they can make those investments in our city. It's that kind, that kind of tailored policy that's gonna make sure everybody can help participate in our growth. And the final thing I'll say is that partnerships are one of the tools we have at our disposal. That cities alone can't do it, counties alone can't do it, uh, the federal government alone can't do it. Um, we all have to be working to build the relationships to, sh first of all, to make sure we have the same universal goals and that we are trying to get those ships sailing in the same direction, uh, to get those same universal goals, and then figuring out how we can work together to make it happen. It's the hardest thing that we have to do. It's the toughest tool at our disposal, but it's also the most powerful. So the last thing I'll say is that um, we are not going to be able to grow our way into equity. But we can equity our way into growth. Let's do it. Thanks. <laughs>